All creation longs for the coming of its king. We join with creation looking forward to the arrival of the kingdom. We gather to share stories of God's faithfulness. To celebrate what he's done in the past and to anticipate his coming again. We look forward in hope. This is Advent where we prepare to welcome the King. Check one, two, there we go. Merry Christmas, Redemption family. Uh, to everyone here in the house and everyone watching online, Merry Christmas season. It is an exciting week. I once saw an artist painting a masterpiece. With lavish brush strokes and bold strikes, he poured himself into his painting like Jackson Pollock on a large kind of wall-sized canvas with an ornate gold frame, pouring himself into this work with passion. And when his masterpiece was complete, this artist stepped back with hands folded as if to say, that's good, that's good. Only next, something strange happened. The center of the masterpiece there formed a spot of corruption, some dark decay, and it gradually began like a crack in the windshield to stretch out its tentacles, reaching its thin, straggly arms throughout the painting, causing cracks and crevices to break forth and threatening the masterpiece with destruction. I wondered, that's weird, how's the artist gonna respond to this. He's just going to chuck the painting and start a new one? Well, no. Next, the artist did the strangest, craziest thing you could have ever imagined. He lifted his leg and he stepped into the painting. First his legs, his torso, finally his head until the merge was complete. The creator merged himself and entered the canvas of his creation, the artist merging his life with that of his masterpiece. And he stepped in in such a way that his own heart lay directly over the heart of darkness, of corruption in his painting. What happened next was almost stranger. The decay and the corruption within his masterpiece began to attack the artist. The long, thin, straggly arms began to work their way back and bam, like attacking the artist at the center of this painting. And he absorbed it blow by blow by blow until eventually the corruption was gone. The masterpiece now restored with the artist at the center of the painting. And this masterpiece seemed actually more glorious now with this presence radiating inside. For the artist did not step back out and remove himself. No, he remained within his creation. And it seemed as if this was actually the way it was always intended to be. The artist at the center of his painting. This is a picture of the gospel. The gospel we find that Jesus is the grand artist, the one through whom all things were made. And God pours himself into his creation and creates a beautiful world. And we read Genesis 1, he steps back and says, this is good, this is very good. Only when sin enters the world, it is like that dark decay, that corruption at the center of the masterpiece that stretches and spreads and threatens to unravel God's good creation. And so how does God respond? Does he just chuck the world and start a new one? No. Ultimately, in the incarnation, the Christmas story that we come to celebrate this week is about the creator entering the canvas of his creation, the artist stepping into his masterpiece to save it. And in Jesus's 
life. He lives the life that we failed to live. He dies the death that was ours to die. And in doing so, he takes upon himself and bears the destruction and the corruption that we've unleashed into God's good world. And he does so, though, ultimately then through his resurrection to restore the masterpiece. And now he has not removed himself, stepping back out, but rather retains his now resurrected and glorified body, exalted at the right hand of the Father at the center of all creation. And through Jesus now, God is reconciling and restoring his masterpiece with Jesus, the divine artist, at the center. We want to look this morning at the artist in the painting. Discovering that Christmas is about the creator entering the canvas of creation and merging his existence with ours, uniting his life, the fabric of his life in Christ with ours in order that we might be reconciled and restored and made whole. We are in a, we're going to be in John 1. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn there, we'll be in John chapter 1 this morning. We've been doing a series this month for Advent called Welcoming the King, where each week we're looking at a different gospel author's introduction and how, observing how they introduced Jesus. So week one, we saw Matthew introduces us to Jesus's messy messy family, messy family. (laughs) They're not on meth, they're not on meth, they're a messy, messy family, right? (laughs) So so Matthew starts with Jesus, they might have been actually, they were very messy, a messy family, and he walks through opening with the genealogy. And then in Mark, Mark introduces us to Jesus as the fulfillment of prophetic hope, quoting Old Testament prophecy. Then Luke, we saw last week, introduces Jesus as the humble king who enters the tyranny of a world under other types of rulers and enters as the humble king to save us as his people. Now this week, we come to the gospel of John. And we're gonna find is that John emphasizes Jesus as the creator entering his creation the artist stepping into his masterpiece to restore it, heal it, and make it whole. So let's turn to John chapter one and jump in. We read, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All right, well, the first thing we see is that Jesus is the divine artist. John opens his gospel saying, Jesus is the divine artist. All things were made through Jesus. He tells us in verse three, all things were made through Jesus and without him, nothing was made that has been made. John opens his gospel in the beginning. Now, your ears should perk up if you're familiar with the biblical story, because back at the beginning, those are the very same words that open Genesis 1, the beginning of the biblical story. It's almost as if John is saying, hey, once upon a time, and our ears should echo back that beginning. And if you think back to Genesis 1, when God creates the world, how does God create the world? He does it through his voice. And God said, let there be, and there was. God said, let there be light, and there was. Let there be air, and there was. Let there be land, and there was. God builds the world, not with hammer and nails, but with his voice. Jesus is the voice of God, John is saying. He is the word through whom the world was made. Jesus is the agent of creation. He is the creative voice of God. Psalm 33, six says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, the starry host by the breath of his mouth. Jesus is this creative word through whom you and I, our very existence has come into being. This means, interestingly, that creativity is a part of the image of God. You might not tend to think of Jesus as an artist or creativity being central to spirituality, but we see here that creativity is wrapped up and is a part of the image of God that Jesus bears. You may be one of those people who finds yourself saying, man, I don't have a creative bone in my body. (laughs) And I can empathize with that. I mean, I can play a little music this time, but when it comes to most stuff, if you see my drawings, my kids like mock and make fun of my drawings because they're horrible. They look nothing like what I'm trying to draw. And yet the reality is 
that you might not be like Jonathan Rojas, who made that amazing video we just saw a minute ago, or a musician like Aaron Anderson on the keys here. You may not be a capital A artist, but all of us are called to be lowercase a artists least, right? That we have been gifted by God with creativity, the ability to think outside the box, to approach things with a fresh perspective, to bring new life and color and vibrancy to God's world. Some of you know Autumn Matney. She recently came into my office and about a month ago, and she was like, hey, Josh, actually, if you just moved your couch a little right here and put this right here, maybe we'll put a small plant here and this here, and like in five minutes, totally <laughs> transform where it's like, dude, this is actually a place I want to be now. <laughs> like, this is somewhere I want to hang out. She brought her creativity to space, to rearrange this space. Creativity is a part of the image of God rooted in Christ, who is the creative voice of God through whom the creativity of our world and of you and of I have come into existence. We find that we live in a spoken world. Will Vesurovich here, he does spoken word poetry but God does spoken world poetry, right? He speaks worlds into existence through his word, Jesus. John 1, here are these verses that we just read are interestingly, they're written in poetic form. John 1 verses 1 to 18, his whole introduction is written in poetry. And I think John is saying, I want to introduce my gospel. I want to introduce my spoken words the same way that God introduces his spoken world by singing creation into existence through his divine word, Jesus. Matter is music. Molecular physicists would tell you that matter is music, that uh, physicists theorize that every atom at its most basic level, you get back, peel it all down to its most basic level, is actually a vibration at the root. Brian Greene in his book, The Elegant Universe, says that simply, yet scientifically speaking, All matter is music. And biblically speaking, this makes sense because in the narrative and worldview of the Bible, we find that all matter is embodied sound. That the universe could be said to be God's voice in physical form. Reverberations of the divine word that was spoken to bring you and I and our creative world into existence. And this raises the question, are you living in harmony or in dissonance with God's symphony? Are you living in harmony in such a way that your life is in union with your creator and running with the lines and the pigmentation and the drawings and the the form and the different nuance and uh, an artist puts so much time and attention into the detail of their masterpiece, wanting each of the different elements to shine forth in unique and diverse array and to bring forth the beauty and the splendor of the painting and going, are you living within the design and intention of your creator to draw your own unique, diverse, particular way that you shine the light of the creator and the glory of his painting with the grain of the universe? Or are you living like sandpaper, rubbing against the grain of the universe in dissonance with the way that Jesus has designed you to live, that you were made in him for God's glory? Are you running against the glory that you were made to display, reflecting the image of our creator, God? The reality is all of us in one way or another, at one time or another, in a deeper level, even in our desires, have run like sandpaper against the grain of God's universe in friction, unleashing unleashing corruption into the masterpiece of our lives and of this world. J.R.R. Tolkien, in his book, The Silmarillion, gives a creation story that I love. It's kind of a creation story uh, for Middle Earth, uh, what would later become like Lord of the Rings and and The Hobbit and so forth. But in this creation story, he has God, this God-like figure, uh, Luvatar. God sings creation into existence. Now, Tolkien was a Christian. I wonder where he got that idea, right? Like, no, he's drawing off of the the riches of this God. God sings creation into existence, and he gives these angel-like figures different instruments to participate and join in the symphony. And so they do, and as they're bringing forth creation, there is one angel, however, Melkor, who kind of 
turns to the dark side. He rebels and he wants all the attention for himself rather than God. And so he begins to throw discord and dissonance, throwing clashing cymbals and clanging and things into the symphony disrupting. And all the other angels kind of, you know, put their hands over their ears and they're like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. And what's the creator gonna do? Like, is God just gonna squash Melkor like a bug because he's ruining the symphony? But no, the creator does the craziest thing that nobody expected, he begins to sing a new melody at the center of the symphony that is even bigger and more expansive. And it begins to encompass even Melkor's dissonance. And within the bigger frame of this new melody, even that becomes part of the beautiful symphony of the whole, which only makes Melkor even matter because he's like, oh, now God's getting all the glory again and my plans didn't work. But the symphony is redeemed, becomes glorious, and reveals the majesty of the conductor of God. Jesus is the melody at the center of the universe. And the same. Jesus is both the melody that God has spoken creation into existence through, but then when you and I and we like Melkor, when we unleash our destruction and our dissonance and our clanging cymbals and our clashing things, and we, we, we try to tear apart the, the orchestration that God intended, Jesus is not only the creative word, he is the redemptive word. Jesus is the new melody that God sings into our rebellious world with an even more expansive symphony that can encompass even our rebellion that he will ultimately bear on the cross and come through the other side and through it all, the depths of his great love for you and for I as his creation will be revealed. And no matter how dark or tragic or whatever parts of your story have been, God is out in Christ to enfold it within the greater drama of his love for the world that has come in Christ and to draw you back into the beauty of his glorious symphony once more. That's what Christmas is all about. Christmas is where the melody becomes matter. The music becomes material. Christmas is where the spoken word enters his spoken world to redeem you and I. Let's go on to verse 14. John 1, verse 14, and see where he takes this. Verse 14, we read, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, John tells us here that the Word became flesh, that the divine artist steps into the canvas, that Jesus, the one through whom all things were made, becomes part of the masterpiece. He is himself made into his world. Now, theologically, this is called the incarnation. The word became flesh. And incarnation, that's a big, fancy-sounding word, but if you break it down, what it's made up of is incarne. And carne is the Latin word for flesh or meat. Like, you might be more familiar with it from, like, carne asada, right? So I don't know if you like tacos. I like tacos. John Crawford is kind of the taco connoisseur who knows all the best spots. So when when I first moved here, he would take me to different spots all around town and find the best tacos in town. And one of my favorite tacos to get and to eat is carne asada, right? But that basically just means grilled meat. Carne means meat, asada means grilled. So when you order a carne asada taco, you're ordering grilled meat. And what John is essentially saying here that the creator became creation. It's like he's saying the master chef became a taco, (laughs) like the maker became one of his ingredients. And why did the creator become carne, right? Well, it's because it's what you and I are made of. Like if you grab kind of your flesh, you know, like your meat, like your your flesh, your bone, like that's, we're we're made of carne. It's like our skin suits, right? God, (laughs) that's a weird image. I, I got one friend who says like, yeah, without God's spirit or breath, this all, like we're just meat sacks, <laughs> like sacks, sacks of meat. Sound kind of gross, sorry. But anyways, like, <laughs> but why did the word become flesh? He is merging 
is existence with the canvas of creation, with the fabric of ours. It's the stuff that we're made out of. He's come to merge his life and existence with ours forever. That he could bear our corruption, bear our decay, bear the dissonance, all those things at the center of his masterpiece and to restore us and make us whole. The word has become flesh. Now, this is mind-blowing stuff. At least it should be. There is a mystery to the incarnation. How does the creator become creation? And it raises the question, have you lost the mystery this Christmas? We can get so swept up in the presents to be wrapped and the agenda to be planned and the errands to be run and the things to be logistics to be coordinated and all the different details and the rush of Christmas, we can miss out on the mystery that is at the heart of the Christmas story. The creator has become creation. I love a poem by the early church father, St. Augustine, who, um, who, writes here is on the mystery of the incarnation in a poem called Christmas. He says this, he says, though maker of the son, he is made under the son. While in the father, he remains from his mother, he goes forth. The creator of heaven and earth, he was born under heaven and upon the earth. Unspeakably wise, he is wisely speechless. While filling the world, he lies in a manger. Ruler of the stars, he nurses at his mother's bosom. He is both great in the nature of God and small in the form of a servant. I love that imagery that Augustine uses that even while he's filling the whole world, that he is the voice, the the word through whom creation was not only spoken into existence, but held together, the the song, the one in whom you and I exist and held together, are held together, even as Jesus is the one filling all things and holding all things together, he lies in a manger, nursing with his mother. That the creator taking on flesh and in Christ becoming even vulnerable, dependent, entering for our salvation to accomplish our redemption. We are summoned you and I to bow and bend the knee and worship before Christ in this great mystery who has come to merge his existence with the fabric of ours, to unite himself with us that we might be restored in his masterpiece forever. We're invited to worship. Now, from one angle, from the outside looking in, This is the artist entering into the painting, right? But from another angle, I want to flip the perspective here, right? If we flip the angle and go from the inside looking out, from our experience within creation looking out, the audio just became visual. Christmas is about the audio becoming visual, the word becoming flesh. Sound became sight. The spoken word entered his spoken world. You see, audio and visual are two different things. How many of you know Jordan? Jordan is back there at the sound booth. Uh, Jordan, raise your hand, man. Jordan, <laughs> Jordan's awesome. He runs a lot more than audio visual production. He does so many things. But Jordan runs audio and visual here on Sunday morning. And he would tell you audio and visual are two different things, right? In fact, he actually needs help another person there with him, one person to, while he's running the audio with the soundboard and all that so we can hear the music and everything, he's got someone else running the visual so we can see the slides and the lyrics and, and, and everything coming up because he would tell you audio and visual are two different things. And here's the thing about audio. You can't see it. Just thing about words is you can't see them. They are invisible. Hebrews 11.3 tells us this. It says that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Saying the worlds, visible, were made by the word, invisible, so that what is seen, the world, was not made out of things which are seen or visible. The world is visible and the words are invisible. And this makes sense. Like when you are in the masterpiece, 
you can't see the artist, right? It's like on another plane or dimension of existence. When you and I are in the snow globe of creation, we can't see the creator. When you are in the novel, you are unable to see the author. Or, Christmas asks us, can you? Can you? Can you now see the author? There's a great old film called Stranger Than Fiction. How many of you have seen Stranger Than Fiction, if you remember, right? All right, in this film, there we go. So there's, there's some, some good, 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 good folks here, good fans. And in this film, Stranger Than Fiction, Will Ferrell, he plays this character who is living his life, and suddenly he begins hearing this voice, like from the heavens. He begins hearing this voice narrating what is happening. And he begins to realize, like, I am in a novel. Like, I'm living in a novel, and the voice I'm hearing is the voice of the author. Only there's some bad news that he realizes the story that he's in is heading towards a tragedy. And so he's like, man, I got to get the author's attention. I got to change that. And so he's trying, but he, can't, he can hear the, the author's voice, but he can't see the author. Until one day... He sees the author. The author is being interviewed on television and he recognizes the author's voice. And he's like, oh my gosh, that's who she is. I gotta go meet her. She's the author. And so he finds her address, tracks her down. He shows up and tries to convince her, hey, I'm the lead character in this novel that you're writing. And dude, you gotta change course. Yeah, I'm heading towards, it, towards tragedy. And here's the thing. When he meets the author together, they're able to rewrite the story in a redemptive direction. They're able to turn his tragedy into a new redemptive future. What if you could meet your author? What if we could meet our maker? What if the tragedy that you're heading towards could be rewritten redemptively? What if you could realign your story with the author's grander intentions That is what Christmas is all about, is the author entering his novel to steer us towards a redemptive ending. Jesus is the author entering the novel. He is the artist entering the masterpiece. He is the creator entering his creation to unite his life with you and to save you. Christmas, unlike Stranger Than Fiction, unlike the Will Ferrell movie, though Christmas is not about us going out to try and find the author. Christmas is about the author come to find you. Christmas is not about you needed to go and get, live your life for God. Christmas is about God coming to give his life for you. And he's done it to rewrite our stories in a redemptive direction. It makes me want to ask, where are you feeling the corruption today? Are those areas, where are the areas in your life where you're feeling the weight of, maybe it's addiction or the habits of life, the ways, places that you've tended to go that are rubbing against the grain of the universe, God's design. Maybe it's not even in you. Maybe it's things that have been done to you, the weight and the force of the clashing symbols and the clanging and the things that people have wanted to write into your story that were not actually the heart of God ultimately for you, but they're things of the enemy, ways the enemy has tried to tear you down. And you're feeling like, dude, my own canvas, the canvas of my life and the narrative of my story feels like it's ripped from the direction that I was supposed to go. Maybe it's just the overall weight of the world. You look out at the canvas of creation around us and you see on, uh, in our neighborhoods and on the news and the stories of friends and family and things that are happening, you just go, man, the corruption feels overwhelming in the canvas, God. The parts of this story that evil has written in just seem like too much to bear. Well, the good news of Christmas is that Christ has come to bear it and that he is more than able. We can bring all those things to him. And as we do, I believe John has one more thing he'd want us to know here. Let's look at verse 14 one more time, because there's another half of this verse that I don't want us to miss. He says, and the word became flesh 
We got that part, right? It's the artist entering the canvas. But he goes on, he says, why did the word become flesh? He dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Jesus has come to dwell with us and to reveal his glory to us. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. We find that you are the masterpiece that Jesus has come to restore. You are the masterpiece Jesus has come to restore. He has come not only to restore creation, but to restore you as his creation. For the corruption and the darkness, the decay, it's not only out there, it's in here. It's worked its way into our lives, whether through things that we've done or things that have been done to us, and it's, it's in us. And Jesus, though, says, you're my masterpiece, and I've come to restore you. Why did Jesus come at Christmas, we might ask? Well, John tells us here he came to dwell with us and to reveal God's glory to us. And with the incarnation, the medium is the message. The medium is the message. You may have heard that term before. It's a term coined by uh, Marshall McLuhan back in the day. You hear it often in media and communication circles. And the idea is that it's, it's not just what you say, it's how you say it that different mediums communicate differently. So uh, sending an email communicates differently than a text message, which communicates differently than a phone call versus talking with someone in person. I personally have a rule of thumb that if we got to talk about anything controversial or difficult or whatever, I want that conversation to be in person, right? So if I'm just sending logistics, just going, hey, here's when and where, like I'll shoot you an email. But if we got some business to tackle. We got something tough to talk about, something hard to deal with. It's like, dude, I, I don't want to do that through email. I want us to be in person, at the very least by phone, because the medium communicates differently. That's the message. But the incarnation, God is essentially kind of saying, hey, for creation, the phone call would have done, will do, right? Like you hearing my voice, that, that's enough. You, my voice that reverberates your existence, reverberates from my voice. I knew. But when it comes to redemption, that's going to require us being in person, face-to-face, right? It's going to require us being in person, face-to-face. Uh, or you could think of it like an MP3 versus a concert. But you can listen to a song on MP3 and like, oh, this is a good song. And then you go to the concert, it could be the exact same song, audio waves, all the same stuff hitting your ears, but it's a radically different experience being in person at the concert. And what God is saying in the incarnation is going, man, yeah, for creation, the MP3 is good. But for redemption, Jesus is bringing the live concert to you, right? Christmas is Jesus bringing us the live concert, this melody at the center of creation. I love the way Athanasius puts it. He's an early church father from the fourth century. And he says this, he says that it is fitting that the renewal of, I don't know if we can pull up that slide. There we go. Yeah, it is fitting that the renewal of creation has been wrought by the self-same word who made it in the beginning. For the one father has effected the salvation of the world through the same word who made it in the beginning. What he's saying is that the word of creation has now become flesh for our redemption. So there's something significant and beautiful that Jesus being the same word through whom all creation came into existence is now the new word, the author writing himself into the story, the new melody entering the symphony of creation. There is a fittingness, Athanasius is saying, in that it's the same one through whom you and I, he's no stranger. He is the one from whom we all were made, even if we didn't at first know or recognize him. And now he has come. God has written himself into the story. He has entered in. The audio has become visual for our redemption, that you and I might be made whole. Jesus' goal is to be with us and to reveal God's glory to us. This means that Jesus is out to restore you. He's out to restore you. John tells us that, what did Jesus bring? What gifts at Christmas did Jesus bring to us? John says he brought us grace and he brought us truth. Now let me explain why those are each so important. 
Jesus brings us truth, meaning he calls out the corruption in the painting. He calls out the things that are not right in our lives and in our world. He calls it out, but he calls it out not ultimately to destroy us or to judge us. He calls us out and he brings his grace, though, to restore us and to heal us and to make us whole. Because grace restores nature. It doesn't annihilate nature, it restores nature. It puts the canvas back restored and whole the way it was always intended to be. So Jesus brings truth to call out what's wrong in our lives and our world, and he brings grace to restore and to heal and to fix it and to make it right. His grace makes us more human. That it calls out the dark decay in your life, but it's ultimately to regrow gardens from God's grace there in order that his beauty and his life can shine forth. Years ago, about a decade, I think 10, 12 years ago, my mom and I had the chance to go to Spain. Uh, We got some Spanish roots. We wanted to go explore Spain. And one of my favorite things I saw in Spain was in Barcelona. It was the Sagrada Familia. The Sagrada Familia is a famous basilica, like a cathedral uh, by the uh, famous uh, architect Gaudi. And Gaudi's cathedral was so beautiful. And here's one of the things that really struck me about it was every pattern in this basilica was designed off of something in nature. So it mirrored elements of nature. So for example, you had the columns in it were uh, designed off of the patterns of tree trunks. And you could see like the gnarls and the double edge and like the same kind of patterns and fixture like you would of trees. And other patterns throughout the basilica were modeled off things like seashells or different animals or plants, all that. And it created this beauty because there's something beautiful when the things that we make align with the design of our creator. There's something majestic when your nature begins to align with the nature of Jesus. There is something awe-inspiring when his love overwhelms your self-centeredness. Something powerful when his joy overtakes your cynicism. When his peace finds you in the midst of your rat race. There is something majestic when his patience calms your short temper. When his peace and his patience and his kindness takes over your kind of quickness to tear people down. When God's goodness overwhelms your wickedness and floods you with the generosity of God. There's something powerful when God's faithfulness begins to reshape your quickness to step away at the first sign of trouble and take off. When his self-control replaces your flippancy and your impulsivity, there is something beautiful when your nature begins to align with God's nature. And when your plans and the life that you make begins to align with his intentions as the creator and the life that he has made for you. We become like the Sagrada Familia, a holy place made by God and for God in alignment with the ways that he has designed for us to live. He is the grand artist with his intentions for us. Jesus wants to restore you and to reveal his glory through you as his masterpiece. The artist wants to restore you in his image. Ultimately, it's in Jesus' image. There's one last thing here I want to see us us see in John, because this this kind of blew me away this week. This was, I just feel like this is so powerful. This is a good note to land on here. Verse 18, John ends his introduction saying this. He says, no one has ever seen God. He's just been telling us that, right? Like no one's ever seen God. God's invisible. We can hear his voice, hear the word. We haven't seen him. No one's ever seen God. But he goes on. But the only God, many of the early manuscripts say the only son who is at the father's side, literally in Greek, in the father's bosom, 
He has made him known. Here's the thing. John describes Jesus, and no one's ever seen God, but his only son generated from his bosom. He calls him here, literally in Greek, the monogenerous, the only generated, only begotten son who's come forth from the father's bosom. And that image of being in the bosom, it's a language of intimacy, of union. He has been with the father from eternity. and He is born, comes forth from the father to express the father's true essence and nature to us. He is the beloved son who from, comes forth from the bosom of the father to reveal his divine nature to us. Here's the crazy thing I want us to land on is when you read later in John's gospel, John goes on to describe himself the same way. John goes on to describe himself the same way. On the eve of Jesus' crucifixion, as Jesus is about to go to the cross in John 13, verse 23, John describes himself saying, the beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved was resting in the bosom of of Jesus, reclining the bosom of Jesus as he prepared to go to his death. Seen in John, every detail is significant. What's John saying here? He is saying, the beloved son has made me a beloved son. He's saying that the one who came forth from the father's bosom is now very me through his cross and resurrection that is about to take place is gonna bring me forth from his bosom to express the life of God, to be aligned with his nature as his masterpiece into the world. This is the Christmas story that the beloved son has come to make you beloved sons and daughters of God. That the only begotten child of God from eternity has come forth at Christmas to make us children of God. That Christmas is not only about Jesus coming as God to be born a child, that Christmas is about Jesus coming that we might be born in him as children of God. This means that God is saying you are his masterpiece. So you might find yourself this morning coming in with a different name, a different story, a different tagline hanging over your head. You might be coming in this morning thinking, I'm a mistake. Maybe it's the way your parents treated you growing up and you feel like, man, I was an accident. I wasn't even supposed to be here. And in the gospel, in the Christmas story, God says, you are not a mistake. You are my masterpiece. I have come to heal you and restore you and shine my glory through you and to make you whole. You are my masterpiece. Others today, you might be here and you might come in feeling like, man, I feel discarded, like a piece of art that just didn't fit on the wall anymore. And so they put it out by the curbside, by the trash. That might've been the husband who abandoned or the friends who walked away. And Jesus says, no, I have come to be with you, to dwell with you, to reveal my glory to you and through you and to restore you with the creator of the, forget those folks who walked away. I've come as God in the flesh, incarnate. The chef has become the taco to actually dwell with you and to make this beautiful smorgasbord. I don't know, this thing that's gonna reveal his glory to the world. God has come to be with you. You might be here this morning feeling like, man, I just feel too ruined. If you knew how far the corruption has crept through the canvas of my life, if you knew how deep the decay and the darkness and the disruption has rewritten my story and has been all threaded throughout me, the darkness just runs so thick. The decay runs so deep. And Jesus has come to say, my love runs deeper. My love runs deeper. I have come to be with you, to reveal God's glory to you, he says, and to restore you and make you whole. The masterpiece of God's creation. So don't you dare call trash what God calls his treasure, right? Christmas is the creator coming bear the canvas of your creation, to 
to restore you. It's the divine artist entering his masterpiece to ultimately restore you as his masterpiece, to shine his glory again for all to see. As we come to communion this morning, the invitation is to what I like to call the inscape artist, right? The inscape artist. You've heard of an escape artist. We tend to think of an escape artist as someone who's trying to get out of a situation they're trapped in, but Jesus is not the escape artist. He is the inscape artist, meaning he is the divine artist who actually enters into the thing that we are trapped in in order to restore his masterpiece, you and all creation, and make us whole. And so as we take the bread, if you're a follower of Jesus, these elements are for you. And the bread is a sign of his body. It's like the canvas of creation that he took to himself in order that he might be broken to bear our corruption and risen to raise us with him whole. You may receive the bread. As we come to the wine or the juice, this is a sign of his life given. The redemptive melody that takes our discord and our dissonance and reunites it into an even more glorious symphony designed by God from before the creation of the world. You may receive the juice. we come to worship this morning, the invitation is to let the author rewrite your story for he has written himself into the story in order to redeem it. To let his design shape and form you in alignment with his character and his kingdom. To let the divine artist who designed you and who cares about you enough to come to be with you forever and to redeem you. To let him restore and make you whole in the deepest parts of the canvas of our lives. Will you join me in prayer?